In Psalm 46, we read, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. These verses are in the midst of God warring against the nations. And God making this promise, be still and know that I am a work. And look and find hope in my coming. This morning we come to the second week of the Advent season. And we take time to remember that God in his coming comes to still us. To bring us peace and to bring us to his glory and salvation. So today... We light two of the candles of Advent. Ah, uh, eventually they light. And we come in quietness and stillness before our great God. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you that we can remember Jesus. And all that his coming means to us. Allow us to know the glory and grace of Jesus Christ today. Father, help us to see Jesus as we come to your word, as we hear of Jesus through the words of the Old Testament. May we understand again the grace and teachings that come from you. And this is the second Sunday of Advent, we celebrate that there is light breaking in in our dark world, and we have the potential of knowing you. So today we humbly come before our Savior, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us as we continue with uh, our series of doing church both online and um, in per, both online and in person, and I've noticed uh, we've lots of people have been tuning into the online sermons, and so I thank you for watching. Um, we are continuing as well on Sunday mornings as long as we are permitted to continue going. And uh, at the moment, we're taping this early in the week. Lamont County is not an enhanced area under COVID yet, but um, we are grateful that God is looking after our community. As we uh, continue with these, I'd just like to remind you, if you wish to give financially towards the needs of the church, you can still do that, either um, by dropping off or mailing in a donation, or as well, you can do an e-transfer, sending it to info.lamontalliance at gmail.com. If you go to our website, there's information on doing that. Uh, many of you, I know, are wondering about ways to to support and memorialize Jane Wirtz. And so I'll throw out that we do have a, um, a special account right now that will be going towards the food bank that we're collecting for throughout the month of December. If you would like to donate something special in her name and her honor, uh, please do so. And, and you have the entire month to do that. Just make sure it's clear on your offering that it's for Jane Wirtz Memorial or, or something that we can figure it out at least. I've also been saying in this time of isolation, if you're feeling isolated, feel free to give me a call. Um, this week we got a phone call saying my wife has to go into isolation for two weeks. It's a hard time when you have to do that. Now, for some reason that I'm not entirely sure, I don't yet have to go into isolation. But, um, uh, you know, we fear that if uh, she comes back with a positive test, we both will. We understand. It is an isolating time. And so if you're feeling that, and I haven't gotten in touch with you, feel free to get in touch with me, and I'd love just to chat. We're trying to get all the technical stuff right. Um, this is why we don't do it just live streaming, because tech stuff can go wrong real quick. And uh, I'm, we're trying to get the music from our church up, and hopefully this week we will have uh, our church uh, music group uh, singing along. I appreciate your patience as we're all on a bit of a learning curve and figuring out how to do this. And, uh, you know, as we learn, we get better. Um, 
As well, I was just going to mention that um, we are doing email updates of our bulletin each week. Uh, that's just started. If you would like to uh, receive an email update, go to um, send it just your email to info.lamontalliance at gmail.com again, or you can go onto our website and find the address. Just send us a quick email just saying, you know, include me in, and uh, we'll do that. And that way you can keep up to date with what things are happening around the church, and particularly as we go through this time of increased COVID cases, just to know kind of where things stand and what's still continuing. I will mention for the teens and parents of teens, uh, the Instagram account, uh, Lamont Youth, that's the best place to, to find out about updates there. I want to bring us to Scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm going to start reading at verse 5 of um, <coughs> this letter that Peter sends out. And in it, it's an important message to the church in which he's just finished talking about the need to submit to one another in various ways. And in the middle of verse 5, he says this, quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Proverbs, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever amen father as we come to your message may you be with us today may we understand the word of god because we know we can only really understand as the holy spirit opens the word of god to us so teach us allow us to hear your grace and your might father be with those who need our prayers for those who are not well for those who are just struggling in this season of isolation, for those wondering, what's happening this Christmas season? Am I going to be able to see family? And they're, they're struggling with those questions. May you be wisdom, strength, and guidance to all. Father, may you be a healing touch. May you be a hope. And may you be a mercy. Father, we look to you as a church. May you allow us to see Jesus, that we may be ex an expression of the true Christmas story through this season. Father, allow us to know your love so that we may bring it to the world. We thank you for all that we have. Your grace and might are more than enough. You're good, and we love you for it. Father, thank you for all that you're going to teach us this morning because we look with eager expectations as to what you will do. Father, we glorify your holy name. Be all glory go to the name of jesus and we pray this in the name of jesus amen i want to go back to the beginning of our sermon series we'll be doing this sermon series on jacob and esau two twin brothers jacob and esau are a bit of rivals in their younger days esau is a is a strong confident young man. Jacob is known as the deceiver. He's one who is not looked up by people. He's, he's not considered a powerful person. God has given a promise to the descendants of Abraham that you will be a light to the nation. And Jacob automatically assumes, well, that promise that's being handed down to our family is going to go to Esau. He's the oldest Everybody looks up to him. He's confident. He's strong. He knows it. And one day Esau comes in from a day's hunt. He's starving. Jacob's made a red stew. And Jacob says to Esau, sell me your birthright for a bowl of stew. 
calling this sermon say, series Seeing Red. Red is often associated with Esau, partially because of the stew, partially appears that's part of his name. Among these brothers, one needed the blessing of God desperately, but the other doesn't understand his need for it. He doesn't understand his power. I mean, don't get me wrong. Esau believes in God. He's been raised. He's been hearing the story since the time he was little in Sunday school about God. And, and he knows it all. He goes to church every week. But it hasn't penetrated his heart. I mean, God plays a role in his life. I mean, he's willing to use God to get an easier life. He might get upset if things don't go well. I mean, that's God's fault. I mean, shouldn't God be there to make our lives go well? This blessing that has been promised is one that you're going to know me so that the world can discover a loving God, so that the world can discover me. And for that to happen, Jacob and Esau both need to learn to submit to God. Celebrating his glory. See, it's so much often in our lives, and it certainly was true in the life of Esau, that it's not about our successes, or for that matter, our failures, you see, the promise of God is not about us. We've seen, as we've gone through this sermon series, how the descendants of Esau are often a distraction in a whole multitude of ways to the descendants of Jacob. The problem is they're relatives. They should be getting along. They're brothers, and as the generations go on, cousins and they're the ones on the inside. The descendants of Esau are not the world out there. That sometimes we in the church fear that they're the world out there somewhere. That, no, these are the guys on the inside. They're the ones inside the church who do not want to really submit to Jesus. And because it becomes about them, that it's not all about Jesus, it's all about me, they create havoc. They create problems. And whenever we start to focus not on Jesus, but on ourselves, our fears, possibly our failures, anything about ourselves... We're not focused on Jesus. We need to be focused on Jesus. We've been working through the Old Testament. And the Old Testament ends with a, a section we call the minor prophets. They're minor because they're tiny. They're, they're short little books. They're a whole series of books. But in some ways in church life, they've also become minor because we tend to ignore them tend to ignore them. The smallest of all of the minor prophets is one called Obadiah. And we find char several characters in the Old Testament named Obadiah. It seems to be kind of a common Hebrew first name. We don't think this was written by anybody who we find elsewhere in the Old Testament. We don't know much about the book. We don't even know for sure when it was written. We think it was written around the time that a group called the Babylonians come and they, they attack Israel and they destroy the city of Jerusalem. They burn it down. They take everybody away into, as hostages. But we're not positive. We don't know much about it. What we do know is it's written about the descendants of Esau. 21 short verses about Edom. Now I said some part of the Bible where we have a whole bunch of little short books. I would tell you, 
Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you've got them along, to Obadiah. Now, i got to be honest, this afternoon, i generally been looking online at my Bibles. I did grab my paper Bible and went to look up Obadiah, and i got to be honest, it took me a minute. And I know the books of the Bible. <laughs> Still took me a minute. If you're looking for it, if you can find a little bit of a longer book called Amos, and a little bit more of a famous one, Jonah, that, that story about the guy gets swallowed by the whale, you remember that guy? Okay, in between Amos and Jonah, there's a little tiny 21-verse book called Obadiah. It's snuggled right in between those two. And it is about a people who've watched their relatives, their neighbors, be destroyed. And they're laughing. Perhaps even helping the enemy. Serves them right. They think they got God on their side. Clearly, they don't. Look at everything's going wrong for them. If everything's going wrong for them, well, how can God be on their side? He must be on our side. Look how important we are. Ah, the pride of Edom. Edom is the name of the nation that comes out of the descendants of Esau. It has to do with the people who are red. And in verse 3, after them delighting that God has made the people of Israel small, it says this, The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwellings, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Pride is self-deception. And do you know what? We all have it to a point. We make it all about me. Sometimes that me could be a, a, a pity party or, or maybe annoyance when things go wrong. It could come out as anger when somebody disagrees with us about something. If I came and I said, I know somebody. And this person is a thief. But other than that, a good moral person. What would you think? A thief, but otherwise a good moral person. Would you think of that person as, as a good person? How about this? I know a person who's prideful, but other than that, a good moral person. Between pride and being a thief, guess which one the Bible has more to say about? Edom, they have a pride in their heart that deceives them because they start to make life all about them. And why do they do it? Part of it is because of the strength we just looked at. They built their main cities into rocks, into cliffs, this is two straight sermons in which unwittingly, and I didn't necessarily mean to do this, I'm going to quote a Sean Connery movie. Uh, last week I quoted The Untouchables. This week you may have seen the third of the Indiana Jones movies. Now I'm going to say my first degree in university was in archaeology. My second degree was in theology. In this movie, it brings together archaeology and theology, and I'll tell you, it gets neither right in any way, shape, or form at all. Do not watch it for either its archaeology or theology. But the one interesting part of it is, towards the end, they go on this great search, and they come to a city which is built out of a, a base of rocks, and it's made out of fancy columns and windows and things like that. Can you picture the city? It's called Petra. It is, still exists. It's in the, city of, or in the country of Jordan, the city of Petra. Now, the fancy columns and all that, the that the world marvels at that were built in ancient times actually came out a little later than the descendants of Esau. They had been chased out of there. We'll come to that story next week. And this, the fancy part of the city was built later. But the city itself was built by the descendants of Esau. They built it right into the rock, right into the cliffs and the caves. Well, that's secure, isn't it? And they felt secure. 
Obadiah looks and says, you're not going to find your security there. But they feel prideful because of their security. Then he goes on and he, he talks about, you know what? If a thief breaks into your home, odds are he's going to miss something. If you're out uh, harvesting grapes, odds are you're going to miss the odd grape. Things get missed in life. But in verse 6 it says, How Esau has been pillaged, his store treasures sought out. Go through that. They've done wrong. And Esau looks and says, but we've succeeded. Do you wonder? Sometimes there's a sin that maybe every once in a while you feel guilty about. But you wonder, maybe I'm getting away with it because God doesn't worry about it. God doesn't really care about this. Can sin be that big of a deal if I don't see immediate consequences? God might just be favoring me. That was Esau. They were getting away with it. Oh, Diet, you're going you're gonna to get it. It's coming. But the moment they're kind of thinking, I'm getting away with this. Continues. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. Now this can turn out to be false freedom, but they're they're thinking, boy, others have come in, they smacked around Israel, they've gotten rid of that country, but boy, they like us. People have a high opinion of me. And sometimes when we listen to other people, it entrenches what I think about myself. It might be to the negative. It might be, oh, nobody likes me. But whatever it is, they're listening to other people who are making it all about them. Edom has become arrogant, prideful, because of their strength, because they've done wrong and they've gotten away with it, because they're listening to other people and what they have to say about them. But that's not it. That's not all. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding on Mount, sorry, out of Mount Esau? Ah, they think themselves wise. At least in comparison of others. Apparently, according to the historical records, there was a school of wisdom there. Boy, aren't we smarter than everybody else. As soon as we think we're smarter than anybody else, that's a sign that pride has stepped in. And then he also says this, Obadiah, And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, Teman being one of the towns of Edom, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. They see strength within their position in this world. And there is a big threat of a fall that comes with this. As I look at this one chapter book, Esau feels more secure because others have fallen. And there is joy in their hearts because somebody they disagree with is struggling. Ever felt that? I'll be honest with you. There's sometimes I've watched the news, hear something negative about somebody who I don't agree with. That's called pride. That's called pride. Idea that we sometimes get is that if things are going well for me, well, God must be happy. Or very least, he's not too focused on me, so I can't be that much of a problem. <sighs> if something goes wrong, well, he's just teaching me a lesson, which there's some truth to, but just part way. God is always trying to move us from self-sufficiency to dependence on him. I want to tell you a secret. There is nothing, no part of our sinful nature that is redeemable. It's all got to go. Anything that we cling into from the old sinful nature is a problem. And God wants to replace it with Jesus. 
And we need to understand the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of the solution that he gives. Verses 13 and 14, he talks about um, people of Esau should not enter into the gate of my people. In the day of their calamity, do not gloat over his disaster. In the day of his calamity, do not loot his wealth. In the day of his calamity, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over survivors in the day of distress. In other words, what's happening is they're looting Jerusalem. As refugees flee from this war, they're turning them back and sending them to the enemy. Perhaps thinking they're doing God's will. They're looking after their own people. They're helping themselves. And their best intentions fall way short. And Obadiah comes along with this warning to Edom, which is meant to be overheard by all of us. In your confidence, you are in danger. I was reading a little bit of a book by A.W. Tozer, a book that I had read er probably about two years ago, called The Crucified Life. And Tozer, who was an Alliance pastor a generation past, says this, I refuse to be discouraged about anything, but it gives me a heavy heart to walk among Christians who have wandered for 40 long years in the wilderness. Not going back to sin, but not going on into holy life. Wandering in an aimless circle, sometimes a little warmer, Sometimes a little colder, sometimes a little holier, and sometimes very unholy, but never going on. Habits have been acquired and are hard to break, and it makes it almost certain that they will live and die spiritual failures. Man, that's a tough word. To me, this is a terrible thing. And do you know what? I've seen this too often. In fact, sometimes I know I've been convicted of this. And this is what Obadiah is really after. See, these are relatives, the Edomites. They're on the inside. They're not some pagans out there. This is a warning. You might do some nice things. You might think you're doing okay a lot of the time, but that's not what I want. I don't know how many Christians think that, hey, I give a little service to the church, put a little money in the offering. God owes me something. I bribed God. God comes along and says, submit. Submit to me. You're going to find so much more in my glory. I read earlier from 1 Peter chapter 5. In case you forgot already what I read. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Beware of the lion. This isn't quite a lion story, but a, a couple of years ago, when the kids were a little younger, we went down to Calgary and went to the zoo. And uh, went... Go to the far end of the Calgary Zoo. It's a big zoo. It takes a while to get across it, but you come to the tigers. And it's a large, huge enclosure that goes, obviously has high walls and goes up a little bit over the top, but doesn't completely enclose the top. And as we were watching, a duck came into the enclosure and landed in a little pond. Now, this was a dumb duck. I mean, there is a lot of water around that zoo. It could have landed anywhere. There's two rivers right by there. Could have gone anywhere. It went to the tiger cage. And suddenly we watched as clearly a tiger's interest had been perked. And it got up and crouched down and slowly moved to watch. And we watched it for a couple of minutes as the tiger slowly snuck up on that duck and then pounced. Now, the duck wasn't completely stupid. It actually got away. But that's the metaphor that Peter is giving to us. Here's what the devil, he doesn't come roaring right away. He sneaks up on, he's, but he's ready to pounce. And what's the big thing that he can pounce on us all over? 
In this context, it is a sin warning about pride. And it talks about worry, which is a type of pride, because really what is worry is that I should have control over things. Pride is not just me boasting how great I am. It is about us focusing on our own life, issues, busyness, struggles, things about me. And do you know what they do? They crowd out Jesus. It seems, from the way I read Peter, that there are moments where I can make myself more important than Jesus. Boy, is it a subtle sin. So I look around the church, it got decorated for Christmas this week. We decorated our house too. Uh, we have a nativity that actually sits out all year, but we moved it to a more prominent spot. It's a very special little nativity for us. I've said a couple times that we've traveled a few times to work with some of our Alliance missionaries in the Republic of Congo and Central Africa. Uh, one of the missionaries there did a work in orphanages. And in one of the orphanages she worked, there was somebody who would come in and work with the orphans, teaching them how to do carving, carvings that they could sell. And in particular, they would carve these little gray ebony nativities. And of course, you go there. They're only like 25 bucks, but it goes directly. The orphan gets all the money and they get a little bit of pocket money. And of course, we bought several of these and brought them back as presents for people, as many as we could get. And this Christian orphanage helping kids uh, in this special way. And it's, the nativity that we kept is very special to us. And it sits out all year, but it gets a prominent place at Christmas. And I bring this up because, isn't that remarkable that Christmas is really about those orphan kids in the Congo? That maybe that story speaks deeply into their lives, and I know it does. Because here's the thing, the, the Bible might, the New Testament has a description that we might place on these kids that they're the least of these. I mean, a kid in the middle of Africa who has no parents and no real hope for a future, who just gets to learn to do some whittling so that they can sell little carvings. God came, the God of the universe, the almighty, all-powerful, mighty, miraculous God came for them in his glory to bring them into his eternal kingdom. Isn't that a remarkable story? Shouldn't that be our focus? Isn't that humbling to think that the God of universe, who is way more important than me, way more important than the stuff that I struggle with, he does this for me. Pride is such a subtle sin that it just pushes aside, here's what God does. We need this continual reminder to look to the God of glory to every day, asking the Holy Spirit to fill our lives, to continually coming to worship, to do the work of prayer. And prayer can sometimes be work. But to do the work of prayer, to be in the scriptures, to keep learning from God. In Obadiah, verse 17, it says this, But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. There's going to be some struggles. But God has not cut them off. In fact, what God is doing, them is, is, doing is bringing them to his eternal glory. And we need to keep our eyes focused on the eternal. To make Jesus bigger so that I am less. To let him grow to live in, not in fear, but in victory. In the um, C.S. Lewis books, all about Aslan, a lion who is portrayed as Jesus, there's one of the books, Prince Caspian, in which one of the characters, Lucy, meets Aslan after a year's absence and says to him, this character is supposed to be Jesus. You've grown bigger. 
And Aslan turns to Lucy and says, every year, my child, that you grow, I grow bigger too. The more we know Jesus, the bigger his glory gets, the bigger his power is, and it pushes our own needs and fears aside. We live in a place of fear. I'm almost going to say an era of fear, but really every era in human history is one of fear. But we're seeing a little bit more in this time of COVID bringing it out. There's all sorts of different reasons why we're fearful, whether it be of the disease or masks or whatever it can be. But I'm going to tell you this, God convicted me this week about a fear that I had. Not so much about the disease, but about was I becoming afraid of where this was doing to the church and what the long-term effects of the church was and what this was going to mean to my ministry. Because I'm going to tell you, this is a, a really hard time to start in a new church. It is a real struggle to get to know people and to, to start bringing out things that I want to bring out. And I was starting to become fearful that maybe this was going to prevent God's work and God then coming in convicting me saying, that's pride. Because when we're focused on our fears, that means we're not giving God room to work. It is arrogance because it's about what I want and yet there's nothing I can do about it. The very last verse of Obadiah says this, Savior shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. There's a strong warning in this. Edom knew better, but could not bring themselves to submit to God because they couldn't get past looking at themselves. They're the people maybe even attended church, but just couldn't ever really come to salvation because they wouldn't give themselves to Jesus. They never really turned themselves over to him. But to those who do, with Jesus in his conquest and glory, what a place to be. There, there's one letter I want you to catch in this. I, what, what I read in that last verse where I said, Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion. Isn't it interesting, saviors, plural. Not just the Savior, saviors. Do you get this? That those of us who follow Jesus are included in this promise? What a remarkable thing. Talking about pride and humility is really hard. There are some sins we can, I can get up from the pulpit and I can just say, don't do it, and it's, it's clear cut. Don't do it. But saying don't be prideful, that's a hard thing to say because it is a subtle thing. Are we proud? The answer is yes. To what extent might be the question. I can't measure it. But I do know this, the more I focus on Jesus and not on myself, the more I focus on Jesus rather than my struggles, my fears, the less I am going to be like Esau and the more I am going to be like Jacob, the deceiver who needed a savior. But I'm going to tell you the great thing about Jacob. He is the one who knows God's eternal glory and the promises on us as we submit ourselves to Jesus, as we look at him, as we make him bigger in our lives, we know more of his eternal glory. Let's take a moment. Let's conclude with prayer. Father, we thank you that you're a God of grace and love and mercy. Teach us today to focus on that and not on ourselves. Teach us to know Jesus fully. We love you and thank you for what you do. As we finish our message today, may your grace and blessing be upon us. We thank you and pray this in the name of our Savior. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us in this uh, online service today. Um, if you would like me just to pray for you after this message, give me a call. Get in touch with me. I'd love to pray with you. There's a blessing in a little tiny book of the New Testament called Jude, also a one-chapter book. I think is very appropriate for this message. 
And in Jude chapter, verses 24 and 25, it says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and forever. Amen.